Hi, I'm Deborah Hamilton. Welcome to my podcast, Why Do Pets Matter? Ten years ago, with my iPhone and a script, I recorded the first episode of the Ultimate Pet Resolution Summit, which chatted with experts about conflicts over animals. Our conversations were intimate, honest, and illustrated how disagreements over animals occur and how those disagreements can reshape people's lives and relationships. In November 2019, I started Why Do Pets Matter, a new podcast that continued these informative discussions. I'm so excited to have you here with me, continuing my exploration into a more meaningful conversation about why pets matter to all of us. My guests and I will share ideas, stories, and experiences straight from the heart, unscripted and holistic. From the bravest moments to the most brokenhearted, we will explore how to resolve disagreements over animals differently. One thing I know for sure is I want to have more meaningful conversations that will help all of us unlock that deeply felt human-animal bond that drives the emotions of conflict. So tonight we're with Doug Pointer, and I have to tell you, he is with BetterDogBehaviorNow.com, and he's going to talk to us about things you can do with your dog that brings up and raises the consciousness of you and your dog so that your relationship is better. It's not about popping the leash or punishing the dog. It's about really reading the dog and reading what you're doing. That's creating the behavior in the dog. I know I'm guilty of creating behavior in my Roxaroni Puxatoni during COVID where I pulled her close to me and I talk about it in this uh, podcast. And she became really very protective of me during COVID and and beyond because I created the situation. So let's now talk to Doug about how we inadvertently sometimes create situations that create naughty behavior in our dogs. And he gives us tons of information on how to solve that problem. So let's listen now. Hi, Deborah Hamilton again, and I am so grateful to be here with Doug Pointer. Doug Pointer has a company called Better Dog Behavior Now. It's a fabulous company. He's been doing this work for at least 25 years. He helps people in the Richmond area, but actually everywhere because of Zoom, have the dogs they want. He works with canine behavior so that you can have the dog that really fits into your family. So without further ado, Doug, thank you so much for being on Why Do Pets Matter? Deborah, thanks for having me. I, I'm looking forward to it. So tell me a little bit about why pets matter to you. Well, there's several reasons for that. The purely shallow and business reason is that I make my living solving canine behavior problems. So from that perspective, um, they matter a great deal. But from a personal perspective, um, you know, I have dogs. I've got one dog now, rescue dog. At one point in my life, I had three male American pit bull terriers in my house, uh, two of which were intact. We never had a fight. Um, my rescue dog is a female. And what I gain I, I just, it just, it, it makes me, pets make us better people. Um, I think uh, some of the things that I'm very interested in is the consciousness that we all inhabit on this earth and to see our pets uh, attempting to communicate with us, attempting to let us know how they feel allows me to get in touch with not only them, but also the way that I operate and I am in touch with my pets and people. You know, I spent quite a bit of time um, in the corporate world teaching people how to sell. And I've taught people and coached people in sports. So I've learned how to, re to relate to people and having the dogs makes me better relating to myself and to other people as well. So I think, you know, what dog spell backwards is. And I think that, um, you know, our pets make us better folks. So that's why pets matter. You know, I love that you brought in the consciousness of your self with your dog and your dog with you. Talk a little bit more about that, because I'm sure that has to do with um, your work as well, because you're going to watch the interaction between you and the dog you're working with, as well as the dog you're working with and their owner. Yeah, the, the, the best. I mean, I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples, but one just most recently was on Saturday. I have a couple with an American pit bull terrier named Butter. And Butter's issue was not aggression. You know, for some reason, people think all pit bulls are aggressive. And you and I both know they're about the goofiest dogs with people that you can find unless somebody's done something bad to the dog. Anyway, 
Butter's issue is not aggression, but he was just so enthusiastic and so unruly that he would just leap all over everybody. And he's a 65 pound dog with a really big head and solid muscle. Oh yeah. And everybody's scared to death of him, you know, because he's a pit bull. So right off, you know, if he's outside, oh my God, we're all going to die. You know, and, and people, uh, they don't have a lot of people to their house, but when people do come over, he's excited and jumping all over them. So they wanted to, to tame that a bit. And when they brought him out, I just got this feeling in my heart that he was just so soft and he was so sensitive. And I asked him, I said, how much does he get yelled at? And they both just kind of sighed. All the time. Right? Said, All the time. I said, you can't do that with this dog. I said, you can't do that with any dog. I said, at the very least what's happening is you're barking at your dog and you're getting them wound up and they're barking back. I said, but this is a very soft dog. So when um, Al, the owner brought Butter out, Butter was just dragging him down the sidewalk, pulling him by the leash. I said, can I have the leash please? So he handed me the leash and he stopped and he just looked at me and I started working with him and moving slowly. And every time he was right beside me, I rewarded him and it took about five minutes and he's walking right beside me and I handed him back and I said, take him back inside and then let's talk and we'll bring him back out and work some more. And when they came back out, I said to them, how did that go? Did that go the way you expected it? And the wife went, oh my God, no. She said, I couldn't believe that. She said, that was amazing. And what allowed me to do that was to be able to feel him. Does that make sense? I can oh, yeah. feel the sensitivity in him and um, you know, just understand that they were way too hard on him. And by the time we got done with the session, the wife was going, I can do this. She goes, this is so exciting. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I do it. I mean, I can feel the animal and I think it's because I can calm myself and observe as opposed to having reactions. You know, a lot of times people in training would see the way he reacted and they would take the leash and they'd pop him with a leash correction. That's old school training because that'll stop the behavior. Well, yeah, it stops the behavior, but it doesn't help what's inside the dog. It doesn't help the dog change. And so when I took the leash, I just had a good grip and I didn't pull it. I just, and he just kind of looked at me and I rewarded him for that. And he's like, oh, this guy is kind of fun. And then I take a step and he take a step and I reward him. And before long, we're walking around and he's wagging his tail. And I send him back up to his mom and show her how to do it. And he sits obediently in front of her and tilts his head looking at her. She was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that. So that's kind of how I do it. You know, it's so interesting you say that because it really is about observation, being observant of your dog, seeing what works, seeing if they even understand what you're asking them to do, because sometimes they're so excited to please you. They have no idea what they're doing wrong. Um, they know they're getting some sort of interaction with you, maybe not the interaction they like, sort of like kids, you know, any interaction, any port in the storm. So you actually took the time what observed in a conscious manner what was going on. And then simply, uh, I always say you decelerate the energy so that the dog can actually think with its brain um, and go, oh, this is what you'd like me to do. Okay, I can do that. And most of us as pet owners, because we're of an age where, you know, you just, as you said, you know, you yanked down the collar to stop them from doing stuff. Uh, that's been found not to be as effective as just engaging their brain with their mouth, if you're going to give them treats or with um, a pet or whatever floats that dog's boat, a tennis ball, so that they know if I do this, then I'm going to get rewarded. Well, that's great. Instead of if I do this, I'm going to get punished. Yeah. So, you know, a story that I tell a lot of my clients who are trying to understand this, I go, you've got to understand that any behavior that's rewarded is going to be repeated. And that doesn't matter if it's good behavior or bad behavior, it's going to be repeated. And so, I always use an example of a client I had with a Labrador retriever, female Labrador, 60 pounds. He said, she's crazy. He said, I can't leave the room. She goes nuts. Um, I can't take her for a walk. She drags me down the road. I can't have anybody in the house. So when I came to their house, knocked on the door, he opened the door. He had her by the collar and she was leaping and he was doing the pullback, you know. And when I stepped inside and shut the door, he was there. He had lost his job. He's 28 at the time. This is pre-COVID. And he was there with his parents, you know, and his mom had a horrified look on her face. And the dad was back there with 
the typical guy look that we have is, why am I here? You know, he just thought this was the dumbest thing, right? And the dog is leaping. <clears throat> and I said to my client, I said, let her go. And he went, what? I went, let her go. He went, dude, she is going to jump all over you. I went, that's okay. Just let her go. He lets her go. And she hits me like a torpedo. I had turned sideways. So she hit me in the side and I did nothing. I just kept talking to the guy. And in 10 seconds, she sat and the father goes, that's never happened. And I said, that's because I'm not doing what you do. Right. You're, you're rewarding. You're rewarding. You're yelling, I love when you yeah. said reward, repeat, like exactly. rinse, repeat, right? You're yelling at her, which is getting her wound up. You're touching her to try to get her to stop, which gets her wound up. And it's attention. It's reinforcing the behavior. And I went, she sat. And so, you know, that type of thing, you got to know how to do that. But you also have to be able to be calm enough to do it and also understand the dog. Now, if I have a dog who's trying to bite me, Deborah, I do not say, let him go. You let know? him go. <laughs> right. And we'll ignore that behavior till he stops biting Doug. We don't say that. But you know what? I have people bring their dog out on a leash and I show them how to hold the dog on a leash so that they're not instigating. And, you know, I, I you know, I may have told you when we spoke before, I had a client with a little hound dog that wanted to rip my face off. But in five minutes, she was seated with her tail wagging. And it's all about understanding the energy that is, that's coming towards you from the dog and not rewarding it, you know, and <clears throat> rewarding, waiting for what we want and then rewarding that. And it works a whole lot better than correcting the behavior. You know, it's so interesting because when I send my Irish setter puppies home with new owners, I often say to them, you have, you know, about three months to gently guide this dog while it's small. Uh, to be the kind of dog you want it to be. And jumping on you as a, you know, 12 week old puppy might be really cute, but it'll never look good on you when they are, you know, a year old and way more and are at a much higher velocity. I said, so you really need to gently guide them to where you want them to be. You need to ignore them when they, um, misbehave in a way that, or behave in a way that's the misbehavior. Um, this all started uh, probably about what, 20 years ago that people recognized that, you know, prong collars and choking the life out of dogs and ripping their heads off actually didn't work as well as just ignoring uh, the behavior or redirecting is a better word for. Well, uh, well here's the thing. Here's the thing. I always tell people, if you can ignore the behavior, <clears throat> that's better. We have to have control though. Like I said, you can't ignore the dog biting somebody. When he stops biting you, we'll reward him, you know? So that's why I have people put the dog, have the dog on a leash. Yeah. And, but I will tell you, I cannot remember. And I, when I started doing this a long time ago, there was corrections and leash pops and all that kind of stuff. That's what you were supposed to do. I cannot remember the last time that I corrected a dog. There's really no need for it. Now, I've redirected dogs gently with a leash, but not no leash pops, no corrections, none of that stuff. You just have to have control and you just have to be calm. You know, I just had somebody on Saturday with a little Shetland sheepdog that jumps all over the owners. He's not a big dog, so it's not painful, but they, you know, they don't like that. And so I taught him to sit. When he ran up to me, he would sit. And so after that, he would come up and he would sit. And I said, that's how you do it. And so you know, you got to use your brain in order to make stuff like this work. So you don't have to do things that damage your relationship with the dog. So let me ask you a question. You and I both know that, you know, we've had multiple dogs, so we might be able to do with the dog something, someone who isn't as facile with training dogs can't do. How do you help clients become in that sort of zone, that conscious place where they recognize that the dog is in a hyper state. And these are the two or three steps that they should take to, you know, redirect or not engage in the energy that they don't want. Well, if, if I'm there when it's occurring, right, it's pretty easy to pick it out. I'll give you an example. The Shetland sheepdog I was just describing to you. When I arrived, he was inside the house behind the storm door and the husband had come out. I always like to arrive early and have them come out without the dog so that we can set the plan for the session. Normally, I ask them not to have the dog see us talking because I want the first interaction to be when we start working. He didn't do that. He had the storm door open so the dog could see me. And while he's talking to me, um, the dog is barking and the, the wife is back there. The wife walks up and while the dog is barking, she reaches down and pets the dog. Oh, and, great. Yeah, to, to settle him down. 
So I was going like, no, oh, please don't do that. You know, and then when they came out and we talked before we worked with the dog, I said, you were actually rewarding him barking. And she went, what do you mean? I said, well, you think you were settling him down, but you were petting him while he was barking. She went, oh, I went, yeah. And I said, can you see how you've done stuff like that in other ways? And she went, oh, yeah. And I said, you know, like if he's barking and going crazy and you pick him up to quiet him down, you just rewarded barking and going crazy. Oh, so I said, you know, we're better off ignoring. I'll give you another example. Last night I got a call from a client I'm going to be meeting with this weekend. She has three dogs, two German shepherds, one of which is a retired police dog, the other of which is a working dog. And then she's got a, a shepherd husky mix and the, Shepherd and the Husky get into fights. They're not serious, but, you know, it causes distress. So she right. sent me a video of the Shepherd and the Husky lying together. And the Husky leans over and starts rubbing up against the Shepherd and licking him around the mouth. And there's a little growling. And, you know, when we talked, I said, you know, that licking around the mouth stuff is submissive behavior. It's like saying, you know, you're above me. You know, I love you. And I, I said, she said, well, he does it so much sometimes that it gets on the shepherd's nerves. I said, well, what do you do? Well, we yell at him and tell him to stop. And so I said, well, why don't you try walking out of the room? I said, are they going to get in a fight? She said, no. I said, just walk out of the room. So she walked out of the room. What do you think happened? Yeah. One of the dogs followed her. They stopped. Yeah. The one who was, they just stopped. And I said, it's, this is about you. So you know, I told her, I said, now don't walk out of the room if they're going to get in a serious fight. But if you know they're not going to get in a fight, then just walk away and take away all the human interaction and you might be surprised what happens. That is so key because it is usually about, if you have dogs that argue with each other, it's about the human in the room. It's not necessarily about the two dogs. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times what will happen, This we really see this a lot with people who rescue dogs. They've got a dog then they bring another dog in and there's fights between the two. And I always tell people, you know, the dog that you have already there needs to be number one relative to you. And the new dog has got to be number two in everything relative to you. So you want to pet the new dog, pet your dog first. Right. We're going to take the dogs out, let your dog out first, feed your dog first, everything with your original dog first. That's how you keep the order. Because if you go over here to the new dog first, you just said to your dog, you are below that dog relative to me. And this dog is now going to go, no, I'm not. And so sometimes when I have people who don't get that, I'll, I'll say, do you have kids? Yep. Boys or girls? Boys. I go, okay. Teenagers? Yep. I know I'm in. I go, all right, well, let me ask you a question. Suppose you brought a new teenager in the house and he got all the attention. And he got all the love. How long would it take before he got beaten up? And they all go, whoa, not long. I go, that's yeah. what you got going on. So I'm so glad you went there because I was going to ask you, what's the difference really from bringing a young dog home, a puppy, uh, and starting off correctly? And then, of course, like you said, introducing or bringing home a rescue dog whose history you might not know. Yeah. Well, you know, besides that history that you don't know, um, the problem is with the rescue dog, everybody wants to pay attention to the rescue dog because they feel bad for it. And, you know, rescue dogs are pretty can, resilient. Uh, yeah. But they can also bond with the people who rescued them very quickly. And yeah. so what happens is if they don't understand where they are in the hierarchy and they get put in front of the dog that was already there, then you're going to have a problem. And that's when people return rescue dogs to the shelter, which is devastating psychologically to a rescue dog. Right. Um, what did I do? What did I yeah. do? Yeah. And so, you know, for five years, I did a class. I, I created a class for a rescue organization here in town called FERS, Friends United with the Richmond Shelter. And we talked a lot about that. And Claire Pollard, the lady who runs that shelter, told me that her return rate went from 20% to under 1% when we were doing that class, because people were beginning to see, wait a minute, I have really elevated my rescue dog over my current dog and there's jealousy there. And so, you know, you gotta be careful with stuff like that. Now, Deborah, when you bring a puppy in the house, you gotta do the same thing. You know, the puppy's gotta come second to the adult dog. Yeah. Sometimes there's some logistics involved in doing that. 
And, and it really is important to make sure that the puppy understands that they are second fiddle or the other dog understands their second fiddle. And I think you put it perfectly when people feel guilty about the rescue dog's life pre your home. Yeah. Uh, believe me, they, they love being there and it, it's not difficult uh, for them to be fed second and to be pet second. And uh, they like all. just being there. They, they sort of are pretty thrilled. Yep. Um, if, if you've, if you've already done it maybe incorrectly, then, then Doug's here to help you undo what you've done, because that's the biggest thing. Um, I'm sure that it's sometimes hard for you to see people uh, doing things with dogs out in the, in the world uh, when you're like, wow, I could just really help that person. But there's that reticence, especially now um, with all the dogs that were adopted during COVID or all the dogs who were bought as puppies during COVID. And now they're uh, a year old or two years old and they're naughty Nancy's or naughty Nick's, you know, they just really didn't have any exposure, didn't have any training to speak of. Some people did the Zoom trainings, and I'm sure you did Zoom trainings as well, uh, but most of them thought they could do it themselves, and they were home all the time, which, of course, has its own set of uh, issues that arise. Separation anxiety is a big thing. <laughs> now, you know, an interesting thing about separation anxiety, I always tell people who've got those issues, I go, separation anxiety is simple to fix but it's a pain, a royal pain in the butt to do it because of the steps that you have to take. Zoom sessions actually work better for fixing separation anxiety because you don't want somebody else in there. Right. Um, and you can get a lot of good work done on a Zoom session with a separation anxiety uh, scenario. But yeah, people with dogs that, you know, the, the, bi the big thing I always tell my clients is your dog does not need you all over him every minute of the day fawning over him. You know, I, I, I joke with people, I go, do you carry him around in the house on a pallet and serve him dinner with a towel over, you know, like you're a waiter? And they start laughing and I go, you know, that's, that's what our problem is here. He'd be just fine laying on the floor, curled up in a ball, or if you let him up on the furniture, you know, curled up in the, on the sofa next to you without you snuggling him like a baby all night long. That's what causes, that's one of the things that causes problems. And so, yeah, you know, COVID has contributed to a lot of that. And a lot of us did that, you know, unconsciously because everybody was going through mental distress during COVID. So the dog became the you know, great equalizer of uh, hugs and kisses and necessary contact and whatever. So they, they became, it was funny. I, I know that you've heard it, that the dogs you adopted were going to have really bad separation anxiety, but I've heard from colleagues of mine who have had dogs their whole lives and went to work all the time, but have been home for the last two years that the older dogs now are having a little bit of separation anxiety because of the change in um, their stature and the amount of attention they got uh, because the parents were home. So then they went into separation anxiety. It's not just a young dog thing. Uh, it's, it can be a dog that never had separation anxiety in its life before COVID. And now because of, I know with my own dog, uh, we walked her every day, uh, five miles a day. She never walked a day in her life. She ran on the four acres and I never had her on a leash and we walked her and, um, she really became very protective of me on the leash. Because okay. every, every time somebody walked by, I'd pull her close to me. I did it. And I knew I was doing it, but I couldn't stop myself. Uh, so <laughs> I'd pull her close to me. So then she became very um, obnoxious to people walking by or dogs walking by because she thought she had to bite them first and ask questions later. So I had to undo that because I realized that my not wanting to meet people during COVID uh, made her she picked up that energy that goes back to that consciousness. I knew what I was doing. I didn't know at the time that it would create the problem that created, but I knew what I was doing. And now here's the other interesting thing is the people that were on the walk were rewarding her behavior without knowing it because they walked away. So I drove that bad guy away. And how did I drive him away? I barked and snarled, which means next time I see somebody, I'm going to bark and snarl and drive them away as well. The dog doesn't know the person was going to walk away anyway. It's why the mailman is so problematic. You know, it's like yep. I drive that I drive that idiot away from my house every day. Every you know, day. Absolutely. UPS Absolutely. guy, the Amazon guy rewards without knowing it, the dog's behavior. So, yeah, lots of stuff has happened in the COVID environment. It is. It's been really very, very difficult because um, 
some people who might not have really ever gotten a dog, got a dog. And, you know, I'd love to get your take on what you think if, if the dog doesn't work out, uh, where the dog should go. I, I always tell people, um, it really should go either to a shelter or, or to a foster or to someone else. If the person truly can't take the dog tank, can't take care of the dog, their life has changed. You really want the dog in a safe environment, not locked up in a crate all day or in a worse in a room with a closed door. Uh, crates are bad enough. I, I love crates. I think crates are great, but I'm one of those who train my dogs to be in crates as their safe space. Uh, but people lock them behind closed doors. And I know for my own dogs, putting them behind a door is just ho horrible for them. Yeah. They just, they go crazy. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of things, <clears throat> excuse me, about the crate. I mean, I think a dog should be able to be in a crate. If the dog's got to go to the vet and spend the day at the vet, it's going to be essentially in a crate. And so if, they, if it goes ballistic in that scenario, that's not comfortable for the people at the vet or the dog. But, uh, you know, I always tell people, well, go sit in your closet for 12 hours and then see how you feel. There will be a whole pent up energy. And, you know, wild dogs and wolves sleep out in the open unless they have pups and they need to den with them, you know. And yep. so I think the grate is a great tool. I mean, the crate is a great tool, um, but I think a lot of times people will overuse it. And definitely putting a dog in a room and shutting the door will drive the dog nuts. Now, you said, what should they do if they can't take the dog or, or keep the dog? Well, here's yeah. my, my viewpoint is could possibly be wildly unpopular here. Here's what here's what I think. I think that unless it's a total, total, total disaster, I don't think you give up. I think you hire somebody like me who can help you with the dog, um, because I have yet to see a scenario that was a canine behavior problem that was actually a canine problem. Right. It's oh, absolutely. The human problem. And I'll give you an example. I had a couple call me about two months ago their son, the fact that they were calling me for their son shows you a little bit about what the problem would be because he's like a 30, 32 year old guy and they're calling for their son. And they said that they had a guy here in town that they wanted to take their son's dog and give to until the son's work environment became better. And so I went, well, what's his work environment? Well, he works in restaurants and he doesn't have time for the dog. And so we got the son on the telephone and, you know, he was about the most wound up person I've ever met in my life. But the problem was he said he couldn't get the dog enough exercise and he didn't want to send the dog to doggy daycare every day. I said, well, why not? Is He can't, can't afford it. And he said, no, no, I can afford it. He said, but I don't want him to get overstimulated. I said, how does he get along with other dogs? He gets along great with other dogs. He's just running around so much. And I went, well, that's what we want. And I said, you know, a tired dog is a good dog. So if he gets along, send him to doggy daycare. That would be better than abandoning him to this guy that doesn't even know him, who is someone who's not prepared to deal with a working dog like what you have. is not going to be able to walk him as much as he needs to be walked. I said, this exercise is a whole lot better of an option. So I always think that there's a way, but if there's definitely not a way, what I prefer is to see people, see if they can find somebody, interview people, um, people that seem to be dog folks that can can handle a dog. Shelters, if you're, if, if that's, you know, if you gotta take the dog, send it to a shelter that deals with that breed of dog or a shelter that's got a good reputation. But my goal is to make it so that shelters are no longer necessary. Right. My, my goal is to say, come see me and let me help you fix that dog, you know, so that yeah. you don't need to take the dog to a shelter because that's devastating psychologically for dogs. Oh, absolutely. The dogs don't understand. And, and one point on the, on the crating. So two points actually. So one is that, you know, I do this map call every Wednesday and the crates are in, are an absolute necessity. If there's a disaster that yep. you need to bring your dog to a shelter or to a hotel, you really do have to have them exactly. be crate trained without barking because, you know, there's, there are other people there. Um, and, as far as making sure that there are people who can help you keep the dog, um, understanding that that if 
something happens and you can't keep the dog short term, long term, you really always should have a backup, either your parents or the breed rescue. If you have a purebred dog or the shelter you adopted it from, if that's the case, because you really want to make sure the dog has a soft landing if, in fact, you can't. But most of all, try to find someone who's going to help you work through these issues because these issues are fixable. They just take a little bit of time, a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of consciousness. Yep. Consciousness and patience because the dog didn't become bad in a day. Uh, You know, they don't come out of the womb bad. I know that for a fact because all of my puppies are perfect. They just sleep and eat and go to the bathroom when they're born. So I know they're not bad when they're born. However, I can, as I said, you know, screw up a one car funeral with my dog walking during COVID because I was pulling her. And so I was setting her up to become, you know, a dog that I didn't even recognize, which was really interesting. Um, So, Doug, let me know what are the two or three things you would love people to understand about canine behavior about how hiring a trainer would be so helpful if in fact they have either a big thing or a little thing that's annoying them about their dogs um, and, and really how they might get in touch with you. Well, first of all, if they want to get in touch with me, my website is betterdogbehaviornow.com. Um, and that's the, that's the easiest way to do it. And we'll put that in the show notes so everybody can find it. Appreciate that. If you want to hire a trainer, now, I'm about to say something else that could be taken as wildly unpopular, but this is, this is what I believe because of what I've seen. Um, if you want to hire a trainer and you are not sure, you have three or four trainers that you're going to go to and, and you know, see what they do, see how they do it. Ask them what methods they use for training. Ask them, you know, if my dog has got behavior problems and I did to you what you would do to my dog, would you be upset about it? And if there's a pause, if you said that to me, I go, oh, no, you can do to me what I'm going to do to your dog all day long because there's going to be nothing done to your dog that's going to make your dog uncomfortable. Your dog's end up loving me before it's all said and done, you know. And so what you want to know is what the training methods are that they use. You know, a lot of our training comes from the dominance theory. And, you know, that comes from wolves. Well, the guy who pinned the term alpha on a lead wolf in a wolf pack, Dr. David Meech, M-E-C-H, University of Minnesota, came out 17 years ago. That's how long. 17 years ago and said, I was wrong. Dominance is not the thing. The alpha in a wolf pack is not because he fights better and dominates. And, you know, our dogs evolved from wolves. And so we thought over time, if it's good for wolves, it's good for our dogs. And so what's going on in a wolf pack is this dominance and conflict. There is no conflict. A wolf pack is a family. There is no dominance. There's leadership. And so what I do is I teach people how that's done in nature, how nature does it, not how we think it needs to be done based how on- How they the leave the pack as opposed to really None dominate. None of that. Right. None of that. And, and so as opposed to some old school idea that is no longer viable, and it's been proven by science that it's not viable. Um, and so that's what I that's what I teach people to do. And so you want to find out how the trainer that you're going to go to is going to handle situations. Let me give you one quick example. I've got uh, some folks up in Maryland with an American pit bull terrier. I don't just deal with pit bulls, but you know pit bulls are so popular that I they get a lot. Of them. I get a lot of them. Okay. Anyway, they've got an American pit bull terrier who will not l- let people in the house. He goes nuts. So they sent me video of three people sitting in their house, their dog going ballistic barking. And every time he barked, the owner would pop him with the leash, the old school leash correction. You remember that, right? Pop yep. him with the leash. So every time he popped him with the leash, he barked hard. And they popped him and he barked harder. And they popped him and he barked harder. And when I talked to him on the telephone, I asked him a question that I don't think they expected. I said, when was the first time he showed fear? And there was this silence. And then the husband said, in training class. And I said, what happened? Well, we were in heel. We were standing and all the dogs were seated politely on the left side in heel. And there was a loud noise behind. And my dog got spooked and broke the heel and, and hid behind my legs. I said, what did the trainer tell you to do? Correct him. And I said, and what was the, that's, that's standard old school training. I said, what was the correction the trainer asked you to do? Leash, pop. And I said, 
Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you got scared that someone popped you in the chest or neck? That would have made you less scared. And he said, I was thinking the same thing. And I said, you were right. The trainer was wrong. Now, this is what the wife chimed in and said at that point. She said, we have spent over $10,000 trying to solve this problem. Yeah. And every single person who knew what they were doing told them to do the same thing. And it did nothing but make the problem worse. So if you're looking for a trainer, make sure you know what you're getting. Ask some questions. What methods do you use to solve behavior problems? Well, I have to say that that is the best point to uh, wrap up on because when I sell a puppy, I always tell my owners to go and watch how the trainer trains the other dogs. And if it isn't something that you want done to your dog, say thank you very much and move on. Yeah. I said, because it really is important. I learned that the hard way with my Irish setter who was phenomenal, but there was a trainer in New York who when they were on their long sits and downs would throw empty tall soda bottles so that they get, you know, distractions and not break. Uh, and so my dog forever would um, either pop up on the sit or lay down on the uh, sit, right? Yeah, pop up on the down and lay down on the sit because of having bottles thrown at her. And I, I sat there and I knew, and like your, your, the woman said, you know, I knew better. Yeah, you know better, but you think, well, these people know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, Doug and I are here to tell you that if you don't think it's right, it's okay to say thank you, but not for my dog. And find someone who is going to help you train your dog in a way that make you partners. Um, you definitely are going to be the leader of the pack, but you don't have to lead through popping or through punishment or through whatever. There are ways to make sure that you are uh, leading your dog down the path to live a great life with you. Doug, I, I would love to have you back because I'm sure we both have so many more stories about things we've done right and wrong um, <laughs> that we could share with the group. And, you know, people really feel uncomfortable um, telling someone, you know, don't do that to my dog. You know, there are several big trainers who pop dogs all the time on television. And uh, yeah. you, you, you think that's the way it's supposed to be done, but really it's not. And the dogs are so much more um, bomb proof. If in fact you train them the way you do, where you really get conscious with what works. So yeah. Doug, thanks so much. So again, Thank everyone, you. if you want to find uh, Doug, and he does training by Zoom as well as, you know, if you live in the area, just go to betterdogbehaviornow.com and you can um, connect with him. Doug, thank you so much for being here. And until next time, everyone, this is Deborah Hamilton, Hamilton Law and Mediation and the Why Do Pets Matter podcast. I'm so glad you were here. Take care. The Why Do Pets Matter podcast drops every Thursday and can be found on whichever platform you find your podcast. Subscribe now, invite your friends, and I cannot wait to have you join me in these conversations.